G'day, the brand new Canon R1 camera has just been launched and to me, it looks like a game changer. Now straight up, I had a play with one of these recently at the Austrian Grand Prix. The guys had one from Canon. They opened it up, they allowed me to have a play with it. I couldn't take it outside the media center, but immediately I fell in love with it. Oh, and the interesting thing was, in Austria, Canon had a sticker over the Canon logo and they had a sticker over the R1. It was very top secret. And at one stage, the guys from Nikon, who also go to most races, they popped over to have a look while I was playing with it. And the Canon guys had to say, no, guys, come on. Did I have to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, when I looked at that camera? It was just agreed that I wouldn't talk about it on social media until this was released. Now, if you're a motorsport photographer, or in fact, any sports photographer, there are so many features on this camera that I think you are going to adore. In terms of the body, there is a slight difference. It's about 150 grams heavier, not huge in the scheme of things. And to me, it felt like it almost just been stretched out a little bit, both in width and height. Although there is some difference in the buttons on the back, and in this dial down here. But first up, I'm happy to say, it takes the exact same battery as the R3. Instead of it taking a CF card and an SD card, it takes two CF Express cards. Before I get into some of the technical stuff, let me go through a couple of the cosmetic things. There was a rubber cover that sits on top of this hot shoe. It comes with the R3 and it was useless. It would last three or four good bumps and bang, it'd be gone. They now have a locking mechanism for that on the R1. And these eyepieces on the back, exactly the same. As soon as you get any sort of pressure, it'd fly off and you'd be buying another one. In fact, um, they're about 19 US dollars each. The new one locks on solidly. And for me and my colleagues that shoot uh, Canon at F1, I can't tell you how exciting that is going to be. The viewfinder itself is slightly larger too, and it is much brighter. And that's pretty handy when shooting in bright conditions. But what I haven't seen is how bright the focus indicator is in that. Because I find uh, certainly uh, a lot of times I'm struggling to work out where the focus dot is, especially uh, because it's white, a white square. If I've got a white background, uh, it's very hard to know where that dot is. Another positive is a lock on the compartment where your memory cards go in. This one's quite easy to accidentally flip open, not on the R1. And there's one of these underneath on the new camera. If you have not watched Canon's introduction video for the R1 and uh, also the R5, I urge you to do so. I've gone through it here. And the things that have stood out to me are frames per second. In this camera, the R3, I was getting 30 frames a second. The new one, 40 raw images per second. This next feature was the one that floored me. It pre-records frames before you hit the shutter. I'll give you an example here where this function will be invaluable. This is Barcelona coming into turn one. I pan with the car, but I ideally wanted the car just past the people. But in order to get that shot, I have to actually either anticipate the cars coming and be panning with them, which is tricky, or I have to wait till it comes into shot and then at that point put my finger on the shutter. But my reflexes aren't that good. So now I can do that where I put my finger on the shutter and that might be the first shot that I would normally get but now I know that I've got shots prior to that. As yet, I haven't worked out how you actually access them, but it's certainly a real plus to have all of those images. The viewfinder is now blackout free. Let's go on to the autofocus and uh, just my limited time with that camera in the media center in Austria showed me that it was remarkable. This model also has that eye focusing system, which I could never get to work in the R3. So hopefully they've made some improvements such that I can use it. Although I'm interested to see because when I often take a photo, say of a, or anything actually, once I've locked onto the subject with the autofocus half to press button, um, I then look around the frame to make sure that I've got stuff in shot. And I think that's something that a lot of photographers forget to do. And certainly I was guilty of that when I first started. I wonder whether if I look around the frame, whether or not that will affect what that uh, system locks onto. Another feature that sounds intriguing is register people priority. So let's say I uh, select 10 of the most popular drivers and put a picture in there such that the camera can recognize them. The autofocus system will actually search them in the viewfinder and lock on. Let's say Charles Leclerc is walking into the paddock. If I could quickly get to that register panel, select Charles, then I know that it will automatically focus on him and. I imagine I don't even have to worry about positioning the focus dot on him. It'll find it for me. But what about if I forget to change it back and um, Fernando Alonso comes in? Maybe then there's the opportunity for me to manually go and select Fernando's head and follow him in. As you probably know, most Formula One photographers send pictures from their camera. And the R1 has a new wireless transmitter. 
You don't need any bolt-on dongles on the side of your camera, such as we had to use with the 1DX. Everything happens in the camera, and if you need to upload photos even quicker from the camera, it does have one of these LAN sockets. Is that a LAN socket? Whatever that is. And I can tell you when that's used, there are a couple of photographers whose sole job it is, is to send pictures back to teams of tyre degradation and sometimes car damage. And they do that with a cable plugged into the camera trackside. So they can only move 20 or 30 metres left or right, otherwise they run out of cable length. But the teams get those pictures in a matter of seconds. How about upscaling a 24-ish megapixel picture to 96? What would that do? Well, that would allow you to get super resolution. So when I do panoramas like this, which I think is eight images stitched together, I will get four times the clarity. Or if I take a wide shot and I use this in-camera ability to upscale, I can crop in on a small section of the shot and still end up with a high resolution image. And how does it actually upscale it? It is made possible thanks to our new deep learning algorithm. Deep learning is designed to enhance the details of your image without deviating from the original image captured. Another feature that I'm not sure I would ever use, but there's an opportunity in camera to do some magnificent noise reduction. So if I'm shooting a night race and I'm shooting at an ISO of, I don't know, 10,000, I could get rid of a lot of the noise associated with the high ISO by processing it in camera. A nice facility to have, just not sure I'd use it. See this little button here? It's a toggle thing. Um, now it's got one purpose on the R3, but on the R1, I might half press it, and that'll give me some sort of action in the camera, or full press does something else. I appreciate these small things, and I'll be looking for ways to customize these buttons to make my workflow a lot easier, and my photography better. And if you're interested in the video side of things, watching this video, I've gleaned that it shoots at 6K raw. It will record a main file and a proxy file, which will be a lot smaller than your main video file. That allows you to edit on the smaller files, enabling you to edit quicker, and then matching up the edits with the main file once you're done. And just as when you're shooting stills, you get those X number of frames before, same with video. So imagine if I was shooting a crash and I was a little bit late pressing record, I've still got that buffer prior that I can use. It just gets even better because while you're recording video, it will also shoot stills at 8.3 frames a second and 17 megapixel sized files. And one of my biggest complaints on the R5, and the same with the R3, but I don't use the R3 typically for video, is it's now got a front facing red light. So I, as the subject, can now tell when the video is rolling. There has been at least one photographer in the paddock using this R1 for a number of races, and that is this man, Vladimir Reese who is uh, pretty handy with the camera. And his major compliment of the camera was the autofocus, which we all understand to be mega. Now I'm hoping I'm gonna get my hands on one perhaps at an upcoming race. Now that it's been launched, I'm pretty sure Canon are going to have R1s at tracks for us to use. And certainly as a Canon Professional Services member, I would get higher ranking than somebody who was not a member. But of course, a lot of the guys shooting Canon, and that's about 60% of the photographers at F1 Shoot Cannon will all be putting their hands up for a go. I'll be getting in early. The question many of you will be asking is, if you have an R3, should you upgrade to the R1? Well, I would say this, if you had the money and it didn't matter, you would definitely do it. It's a no brainer for me. It's a better camera with some truly outstanding features and there's no doubt your photography would be better. With a price of around 6,300 US dollars for a body, is there that much difference? Well, my son, Jace, who shoots F1 with me, will be saying, yes, Kim, you've got to have the R1s, and I'm getting them anyway. But he will be thrilled because he will end up with these R3s. And if you've come from a 1DX to an R3, it's chalk and cheese. But if you go from a 1DX to an R1, I imagine that's just a mind blower. When will they be available though? My understanding is the R5, which I'm using at the moment, not the new one, but uh, the original R5 to record this video. That will be available a lot earlier than the R1, which I understand is probably November. Now I hope I'm wrong and both come out earlier. Now keep a look out for my videos from Budapest this weekend because it may well be that I end up with an R1 and I can tell you a little bit more about it from behind the lens out on track. That would be a dream. Now I will ask one favor of half of you, the other half you can turn away. Those of you who are unsubscribed, could you please do your part and be a subscriber? Appreciate that if you do, and uh, if you haven't liked this video, what are you waiting for? And for all of my stuff, these are the websites and links you will need. Thanks for watching, and stay passionate. The mega, ah, oh,